euh, pour l'existant. Thanks a lot for the invitation. It's uh, great to have the chance. And uh, yeah, I think I enjoy these online talks actually. So I'm very happy to be able to, to do this. Um, so what, what I'll be talking about, uh, I'll try not to be too technical. What, what I'll be talking about is at the intersection of uh, differential geometry. So uh, I'll be studying some uh, geometric partial differential uh, equations and uh, algebraic geometry. So these are equations that have relevance in algebraic geometry. So the, the main theme, before I go into any of the specifics, will be the interplay between two things. So on the one hand, we'll have existence of solutions of geometric PDs. And what the geometric means is something I'll explain. Basically, they'll involve curvature quantities. And what we'll be interested in is relating properties of these partial differential equations to algebraic geometry, so to so-called notions of stability in algebraic geometry. Okay, so the, the point will be to relate something on the pure differential geometry side to the pure algebraic geometry side. And the setting, because we want to do differential geometry and algebraic geometry, will be a, a smooth, complex projective variety. So smooth projective variety over C, so we can equally view this as a complex manifold if we want. OK, and the point today will be there have been many instances where this philosophy that these two things should be related have been established or conjectured at least. What I'll do today is give a, a general framework for understanding these problems. And I, I won't really get into this, but I'll, I'll just mention at the start and probably not at all again, that all of this is motivated by this notion of uh, Brazilian stability. It's a very technical, and very abstract notion of stability on triangulated categories. And uh, I'll stay away from anything categorical or anything triangulated or anything really uh, abstract in that sense. Everything I do will be very concrete and end towards. But somewhere in the background is this notion of bridge line stability that's playing just a motivational role rather than a practical role. OK. So. What I'll do is begin by just spending a few minutes talking about some of the, the basic players in complex geometry. So what a, a Kähler metric is basically, and what, what the point of the Kähler condition really is. So, so uh, intro to complex geometry. And, and this will allow us to see the sort of basic links between algebraic and differential geometry. So our setting is X. Oh, I'll try to remember to use different colors to make it look a little bit better, but I can't guarantee I'll be completely consistent. Um, so X will be smooth, projective uh, variety over C. So projective means that X embeds inside projective space for some projective space PN. And I'll choose L to be an ample line bundle. And these are the line bundles that give you embeddings in projective space. So what this means is that there exists an embedding of X into some other projective space possibly, such that, so projective space has this natural line bundle O of one. And I'll say that the pullback of this O of one line bundle is isomorphic to L, maybe after taking some tensor power. So if, if you haven't seen this condition before, it won't really play much of a role in the, the talk, beyond the fact that these are the line bundles giving embeddings in projective space. So we've got a projective variety that has lots of embeddings. The way to actually get a, an embedding is to use uh, an ample line bundle. So th these are one of the fundamental objects in algebraic geometry. So what we want to do is to understand this notion of ampleness in terms of differential geometry, because this will essentially be the Kähler condition that will be the, the object that we use for the PDE theory. Okay, so if I take H 
a Hermitian metric. My line bundle, this is just a, a, a complex line bundle, so I can ask for a, a Hermitian metric. So this produces what's known as the, the curvature, which is a one one form. And I'll explain how this process works locally. This, this, this notion of curvature is really something you can get your hands on. It's very explicit. And the point is, once we have this one one form, which is the curvature, we can ask basically that this induces a Riemannian metric. So omega is further Kähler constructed in this way. If we get a Riemannian metric after applying the complex structure. So really you should think about Kähler metrics as the Riemannian metrics that interact well with the fact that you have a complex manifold rather than just a smooth manifold. So this is uh, the endomorphism, J is the endomorphism of the tangent bundle of X given by the fact that you have a complex manifold. So analogous to multiplication by I. So these are Riemannian metrics really that interacts well with the complex structure. So th these are the ones that recognize that you're on a complex manifold rather than just a smooth manifold. Okay, so I promised I'd explain how you actually construct omega so we can see what it looks like locally. So if S is a nowhere vanishing section, holomorphic section of our holomorphic line bundle, we can't ask for such a thing to exist globally usually, but we can at least locally. Then, okay, what do we get? We know that the norm squared of S can be measured with respect to H. Because S is nowhere vanishing, this has to be strictly positive. So I can write this as E to the minus phi, where phi is a real valued function because it's strictly positive. And then this curvature is basically just the Hessian of this function. So omega is equal to I del del bar phi locally. So on U. And one thing I'd like to point out then is that what's clear from this is that omega is actually a closed form because it's del del bar phi. And in fact, omega, so d omega is zero and the class of omega is really the, the first term class of the line bundle. So the, the first topological information you associate to a line bundle. Okay. The Prototypical result relating algebraic geometry to differential geometry is then what's known as the Kadira embedding theorem. So th th this characterizes the key algebraic notion of embeddings into projective space, i.e. ampleness through the differential geometry. So the, the theorem states that L is ample if and only if the first term class of L is a Kähler class, that is C1 of L is equal to the class of omega for some omega, which is Kähler. So once you actually have a line bundle, this notion of ampleness, which is very important in algebraic geometry, is captured by this sort of uh, positivity property in, in complex differential geometry. Okay. And so basically what we'll try to do is ask much more precise questions along these lines, trying to relate algebra geometric properties to notions that are more on the complex differential side. But what I'll say one more remark is that there are in fact many, many Kähler metrics once you actually have one. So the, the space of Kähler metrics is really infinite dimensional in a fixed Kähler class. Basically, it's locally parameterized by smooth real valued functions on the manifold, which is uh, itself a uh, infinite dimensional manifold or an infinite. So you, you get basically an open subset in an uh, infinite dimensional real vector space. 
So in particular, you get lots and lots of choices of Paler metrics once you actually have one. And the sort of question we'll be interested in is um, how, how do you determine a canonical choice of Paler metric? And that's what will lead us to these geometric PDs. Okay. So I'll turn to the complex differential geometric PDs now, but before I, I go to that, um, please interrupt me if there are any questions on any of this. The, the talk I, I hope won't be very technical, but it will cover quite a few different areas in complex differential geometry and complex algebraic geometry. So please do interrupt me if there are any, any questions and I'll be happy to say something more. But okay, so the first type of complex differential geometric PD we'll be interested in is the so-called uh, constant scalar curvature condition. What will be important from this is really just to remember that Kähler metrics are Riemannian metrics that interact with the complex structure appropriately and they're, they're the sort of thing that we want to study. And so what we want to do, given that there's quite a lot of choice of them uh, when they exist, what we want is a canonical or best choice of Kähler metric. By asking it really to solve some geometric PD. Geometric meaning involving curvature quantities. So what we'll do first of all is associate curvature quantities to the Kähler metric. If you're knowledgeable about Riemannian geometry, you can just say, okay, well, in fact, the Kähler metric uh, induces a Riemannian metric and you can take natural curvature quantities associated to the Riemannian structure. For example, the, the two most important ones for today will be the Ricci curvature of a Riemannian metric and the scalar curvature. In fact, what happens in Kähler geometry is that these uh, fundamental curvature quantities have easier expressions that will be uh, better for generalization, basically. So what I'll do is explain how to derive these quantities purely in terms of Kähler geometry. So I'll start with the Ricci curvature. It's really the same quantity as the, the Riemannian quantity, but in Kähler geometry up to this constant i over two pi, how you can get at it is by looking at the curvature i del del bar of log of omega to the n. Okay, so we have to interpret this. So here, omega to the n is a volume form. This is really, this is really just um, the condition that omega is non-degenerate, so it's positive, which is coming really from the Riemannian condition. And it locally looks like something like f dz1 wedge dzn wedge dz1 bar wedge dzn bar and throughout will be the dimension of x. So in fact, what we get is a metric or Hermitian metric on minus kx, which is the top exterior power of the holomorphic tangent bundle. So how can we see this? What we need to do is consider what a local holomorphic section of the anti-canonical class actually looks like. So because it's defined by this exterior power, a section looks like d over dz1 wedge d over dzn. And okay, so we take one of those, we take its conjugate, we use the pairing between that and the volume form, we get back a number. So we get this metric on minus kx and the Ricci curvature reach omega it's minus i del del bar of log of something. So it's basically just the curvature. So it really is just the curvature. So is the curvature of this metric. So depending on how much you like Kähler geometry, I, I think this is a lot nicer than the pure Riemannian expression, but nevertheless. And okay, the second thing we do is we associate the scalar curvature of a Kähler metric. So the scalar curvature of omega, again, this is the same as the Riemannian quantity, but in Kähler geometry, we get a simpler expression by taking m, and then we take reach omega. This is a one-one form. We wedge with omega to the n minus one, 
we get an n n form. We divide by omega to the n, and we'll get back a function where this division is allowable because omega to the n is actually a volume form. So this is in C infinity of XOR. So this is just a function. This is the scalar curvature. The definition then of a constant scalar curvature metric is the obvious one. We just ask that the scalar curvature of omega is actually constant. So omega is a CSCK for constant scalar curvature Kähler metric if the scalar curvature of omega is constant. OK, so I'll just mention that this is a fourth because varying a Kähler metric can be uh, done through varying a function. This is really a fourth order scalar PDE, uh, which is fully nonlinear and elliptic. These technical and analytic things won't be really such a role in what I'll actually say, but they do play quite an important role in the general theory and actually many of the proofs. Okay, the, the key points actually will be that these don't always exist. So solutions to this PDE do not always exist. And what we'll be interested in is characterizing the existence in terms of algebraic geometry. And th this is a classical theory at this stage going back 20 years, depending on whether or not you consider 20 years to be classical. Um, and the algebra geometric notion of stability that plays the role here is the notion of case stability. So what's the point here? So the notion of case stability involves two things. It involves a class of degenerations of the variety, and then it involves associating a numerical invariance and asking that that's actually positive. So we consider test configurations, which are the degenerations, So degenerations of XL are a smooth projective variety with a sample line bundle called test configurations. The notion is due to Donaldson. So what do we have? We have curly X, curly L over C, where this map is pi. So what do we want? We want curly X to be a smooth variety. L will be a line bundle that I'll require to be ample on all of the fibers of the map pi. So this is ample on fibers of pi. Okay, I'll, I'll require that the C star action on C lifts to a C star action on curly X and curly L, making pi C star equivariant. And really the key condition for this to be a degeneration of XL is that the fiber XT LT so this is pi inverse of t for t and c. This is isomorphic to xl for all t not equal to zero. So we think about this as a degeneration of xl to the central fiber x0, l0, which could be singular. So x0, l0 could be singular. So what I said is that case stability involves two things. First of all, degenerations, but then second of all, numerical invariance that you associate to these degenerations. The numerical invariant is called the donaldson futaki invariant, and it will be defined using intersection theory. So because we want to do intersection theory or in the differential geometric perspective, because we want to do integration, what we need to do is have a compact space that we can integrate over. Curly X is non-compact. But it admits a, a kind of canonical natural compactification. So we compactify to what I'll still write as curly X, curly L, which is a new family over P1, just trivially over infinity. So trivially at infinity. So I think about P1, the Riemann sphere is C union infinity. And so in particular, this, this fiber X infinity, L infinity. It's also isomorphic to XL. And this is always possible because of the structure of the test configuration. So you can do this in a canonical way. Okay. 
I'll denote this uh, less important topological constant mu of XL. This is minus KX dot L to the N minus one over L to the N. So I'll write integrals over X to remind you that you could think about this as uh, integrating closed differential forms if you wanted to. The Donaldson Pataki invariant is also an intersection number but now over the n plus one dimensional variety curly x. So it's given by n over n plus one, mu of xl, and then curly l to the n plus one. Again, this is a, a number because curly x is n plus one dimensional, plus l to the n dot kx over p1. So th this thing is called the relative canonical class kx over p1, and it's just equal to kx minus pi star kp1. Okay. This allows us to define case stability, which is really what we're interested in in relation to this uh, linking of PDEs with algebra geometric stability conditions. So XL is case stable. If for all test configurations, curly X, curly L, we have positivity of the Donaldson Fatakian variant. Okay, and what's the point? The point is the Itian Donaldson conjecture. It's one of the central conjectures in Kähler geometry, which relates this to the PDE side. So C1 of L admits a CSC K metric. So a canonical choice of Kähler metric solving this uh, PDE, if and only if XL is K-stable. So you're characterizing the existence of solutions of this quite challenging geometric PDE in terms of this algebra geometric stability condition. I, I won't go into a full report on what's actually known about this, but I'll, I will mention that in one special case, which is the, the Kähler-Einstein case, when you're looking for Kähler-Einstein metrics, which only makes sense on certain types of manifolds, this conjecture is actually known from about a decade ago at this stage. And the other thing to mention is that one direction is known, the existence of CSCK metrics is implied by case stability. So going from a solution to the PDE to the, the algebra geometric condition is something we know how to do in general. And there are lots of other special cases where the, the theory has proven to be extremely rich and uh, quite strong results are known. But okay, we won't actually be interested in the story. What we'll be interested in is trying to understand why this sort of link exists and, and how we can sort of give a general framework for understanding these sorts of problems. So this is the notion of a, what I'll, what I'll call it a Z-critical Kähler metric. This is a, a return now to the complex differential geometry, the PDE side. So this is a notion that is on a, it's in a paper I, I put on the archive maybe six months ago or something like that. Okay, so what we want to do is to understand a general framework. So we want a general framework linking the PD side to the algebra geometric side. Now, because we're, we're not doing anything canonical anymore, you know, the, the CSEK story linking the kind of most natural PDE to the most natural of algebra geometric stability didn't require any input. What we'll be interested in is given some extra input, what can you actually produce in terms of an analogous conjecture? But we'll need input because we're no longer doing one possible thing, but rather we're trying to do every possible thing. So the, the, the extra input is quite a, quite a natural thing, I think, from that perspective. So we require some topological input which by analogy with bridge instability, I call it a central charge. There's a, a very explicit piece of topological information that I'll um, now give you the, the formula for. So really what we'll do is we'll fix, first of all, a sequence of complex numbers. So row is row zero up to row n. So this is n plus one complex numbers. I'll assume always that row n is i and that the real powers of rho n minus one is negative. Th these are really just normalization conditions that aren't so important. 
I'll fix some kind of arbitrary cohomology classes on the manifolds as well. So theta is in the direct sum over J greater than zero. So it's it's a sum of complex JJ forms or closed JJ classes. So H JJ back C such that the degree zero part is just one. And I'll, I'll fix a representative theta inside theta. So d theta is zero. And the class of theta is equal to the capital theta. So this is just a representative via differential forms. And I'll fix a polynomial in the, the canonical class of x, so f of kx. Uh, this is given as the sum from l is equal to one to n al kx to the l, where again, the al are complex numbers. So I can include higher turn classes if I want to, but it makes some of the story much less explicit. OK, then what do we do? We set z of xl, which will now actually include a parameter, epsilon. Basically, the reason is that what we'll actually be interested in is the behavior as epsilon varies. So Z epsilon of XL, the central charge, this is the sum from L is equal to zero to N rho L epsilon to the minus L, then the integral over X of L to the L dot F of minus KX dot theta. And this is a complex number for every choice of epsilon. So epsilon will be a real parameter that we'll be interested in varying. And when we're interested in a fixed value of epsilon, we'll write this as Z of XL. So here we consider uh, epsilon equals to one uh, fixed. So it's considered fixed. This is really only important for the actual main results for what we'll be interested in is, is the behavior as epsilon varies. Okay, so th this Z is what I call a central charge by analogy with bridge instability. It's a complex number, and so I can take the arguments, and that's something that will play an important role. So phi epsilon of XL is the argument of Z epsilon of XL. And I'll always assume that Z epsilon is actually non-zero so that I can actually take the, the arguments of the complex number. What we're trying to do is write down PDEs. So what we want to do is write down some kind of differential geometric PDE that's associated to the central charge in such a way that the, the CSCK condition, the constant scalar curvature condition becomes a special case. So we associate to a given intersection number, a given term written as L to the L dot minus KX to the J dot theta, the function depending on a choice of Kähler metric, So one term looks quite natural, at least from the point of view of turn Bay theory. So it looks like omega to the L wedge reach omega to the J wedge theta to get a function I divide by omega to the N. But actually for the PD that I'll write down to have any links with algebraic geometry, we also need a, a more challenging term, which looks like minus J over L plus one. And then we have to take a Laplacian of a shift of the first function. So we consider now omega to the L plus one wedge reach omega so the j minus one, which these are divided by omega to the n. So the Kähler metric determines the Riemannian metric and hence the choice of Laplacian. Bilinearity. What we get is a complex valued function, which I'll write z tilde of omega. So this is in C infinity of xc. This is a complex valued function because the aj, the rho j are actually complex numbers and the theta can be a complex differential form. And okay, this allows us to define this general PDE. Omega is a z epsilon critical Kähler metric If now the condition is that the imaginary part of e to the minus i phi epsilon of xl times z tilde epsilon of omega is equal to zero. So this is basically asking that this complex valued function z tilde of omega has constant arguments. 
So that, that's that's basically what the condition is asking. One remark I really need to emphasize is that this really presents serious new challenges that you don't get in the CSCK story. And those difficulties are basically coming in because it's a sixth order PDE rather than a fourth order PDE because of the presence of this extra Laplacian term. This is a sixth order PDE. And even ellipticity is not guaranteed in general. So this is quite a challenging PDE. But nevertheless, it seems to be the right geometric PDE to actually be linked with algebraic geometry. And so that's, that's what I'm going to turn to next. But any questions before I go on about the, the PDE side? OK. So next up is algebraic geometry. So here the notion is uh, Z-stability. And basically what we want to do is to our choice of central charge, we want to associate a algebra geometric notion of stability, again, generalizing the CSCK theory. Uh, so in this case, generalizing the notion of case stability. Okay, so we'll fix that epsilon as before. So the input is the same. It's just a central charge that, that determines and kind of governs our theory. And the degenerations will be the same as in the traditional case stability theory. So we'll fix that epsilon as before. And we'll fix a test configuration, curly X, curly L over P1. So remember, a test configuration is a degeneration of XL. So the central fiber is something else, but all of the non-zero fibers are, are the variety XL that we actually care about. What we want to do is to define a new algebra geometric intersection number associated to a test configuration that will play the role of the donaldson futaki invariant. So defined in such a way that stability will mean that this invariant is actually strictly positive. Now, the, the tricky thing is that it's hard to make sense of theta directly on the test configuration itself. So to get around that, what we'll do is we'll, we'll have to pass to a birational model where we can actually make sense of the relevant intersection number. So we'll pass to what's called an algebraic geometry, a, a resolution of indeterminacy. So we'll pass to something curly y, which is a morphism down to curly x. Now, if we consider the trivial product x times p1, then curly x is actually isomorphic to x times p1 apart from along the, the central fiber. So what we say in, in algebraic geometry is that these are birational. They're, they're isomorphic on an open dense subset. And you can construct such a y in such a way that it actually also has a morphism down to x times p1. So the point is then on curly y, we can make sense of everything that we need for So we can make sense of the following intersection number, the integral over curly y of curly L to the L plus one dot k x over p1 to the j dot capital theta. And what do I mean by this? So if this is p and this is q, really this is q star theta and this is p star of the canonical class, and this is P star L. So we can do assume, make... Do you assume curly Y is smooth? Yes. Okay. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so that isn't something that happens for free, but you can take Y to be smooth if you want to, just by taking a resolution of singularities or something. Okay, and in fact, also by hypothesis, curly X is smooth as well. So I'll just define this be what I mean by the integral over curly X of L to the L plus one dot K X over P one to the J dot theta, where the point is that actually this thing on the right-hand side doesn't really make sense because it's not possible to make sense of capital theta on curly X itself. 
So we're forced to pass this uh, curly Y. Okay, so by linearity, we get what I'll write as Z epsilon of curly X, curly L, the central charge of the test configuration. And we'll write, that this is again a complex number for each choice of epsilon. And we'll write this as Z of XL, curly X, curly L, again a complex number, if epsilon equals one is considered fixed. Okay, so we start off with this choice of topological input, the central charge, which depends on powers of the canonical class and some other cohomology classes. And what we've done is define a PDE. And what we're trying to do is to define a notion of algebra geometric stability. So what we want to do is to these degenerations require positivity of some kind of number. And that's what this notion of Z stability will mean. So our definition then, so that XL is, first of all, Z-stable. This will be the relevant uh, condition when epsilon is, is fixed. So it's Z-stable. If for all curly X, curly L, we have the condition that the imaginary part of Z of curly X, curly L over Z of XL, is actually positive. So basically we've got these complex numbers. We take a quotient and we were asked that the imaginary part is strictly positive. This can be interpreted as a sort of inequality of the arguments if you prefer, which is the way that um, this notion of bridge line stability that I haven't really talked about is usually presented, but it's very much motivated by that story. Because I'll, I'll be interested in the main actual results of the story, in what happens when epsilon varies, I'll also define this notion of uh, asymptotic Z stability. So this will require that for all test configurations, curly X, curly L, we have the same inequality, but just for very small epsilon. So we have the imaginary part of Z epsilon, curly X, curly L over Z of XL, uh, Z epsilon of XL. This is positive for all epsilon small. Okay, so the, this, this condition for all epsilon small, this is what's really referred to in the kind of physics literature as the large volume limit. It's what happens as you scale L the line bundle, which is changing the volume. The whole point of these definitions is the following conjecture, which is a, a generalization of the itn Donaldson conjecture. So it links the, the geometric analysis, the solvability of these geometric PDEs. So XL admits, or C1 of L, admits a solution of this uh, sixth order Nonlinear PDE. If and only if it satisfies this algebra geometric notion of stability. If and only if XL is Z stable. Okay. So I'll make some remarks. First of all, the, the Yautian Donaldson conjecture fits into this story. So this is the link between CSCK and K stability. So this corresponds to choosing Z of XL to be, I, I hope I get my conventions right, I L to the N minus KX to the N minus one dot L to the, sorry, KX. So I L to the N minus K X to the uh, L to the N minus one. Okay, so if you put in this choice of central charge into the PDE side, you'll just get the CSEK condition. The sixth order term doesn't appear because you, you don't have, that, that only comes in when you have two powers of the canonical class or above. 
Um, on the algebra geometric stability condition, again, the fact that you've only got one power of kx means that you're only seeing one power of k of the test configuration. So you recover the donaldson pataki invariance as well. The second thing to mention is that this gives an analog or a first approximation to an analog of Bridgeland stability in the setting of varieties. This gives an analog of Bridgeland stability for varieties. So many of the applications of Bridgeland stability really come because you can vary the stability condition. So this is a, a very abstract general notion of stability that is sort of motivated by vector bundles or coherent sheaves. And all of the applications really come from the idea that you can vary the stability condition. So I hope that at least some of those applications can apply to this manifold theory. The, the final one, is that it's very likely that you actually need some kind of assumptions on Z and theta for this conjecture to actually be true. So basically what, what happens in Bridgeland stability is that you start off with the question of what's a general notion of stability for a vector bundle and what you realize is that actually to get a really compelling, convincing theory, you need to use uh, categorical techniques. So you need to pass from vector bundles to complexes of vector bundles or complexes of sheaves. And you end up with this very abstract axiomatic notion of stability. What I expect to happen here is that this conjecture should only be true for certain Z. And if you want to get something that's true for arbitrary Z, then you're no, going to need to input some kind of category theory, some kind of analog of a, a complex of vector bundles, but in the setting of uh, varieties instead. For these, uh, the assumptions seem a little bit more harmless. I, I think really what you need is some kind of positivity assumption on these uh, forms theta. So for example, if theta is a 1-1 one, one form, then you should require that it's a semi-positive or something like that. And there are probably some kind of notions that, that make the story work for higher degree classes. Okay, so I'll take another six minutes and what I'll do is just explain the main results. So basically the point will be to prove this conjecture in a model case, but a model case that's convincing enough that I, I think it says that this conjecture is really the right geometric conjecture to have made. So all of the results, concerning the large volume limit so this is the regime where zero so this epsilon is actually chosen to be very small so what will be relevant is this asymptotic notion of stability asymptotic said stability okay so if we imagine that this is the space of central charges, or what you might call the space of stability conditions, what we have is a, a point at the boundary of the space. So th this is where we have, um, K stability and CSCK. So this is the, the formal limit when epsilon tends to zero. So we, we get a point at the boundary of the space of non-trivial central charges. And what we're interested in is the behavior, what happens when we go in just a little bit to the space of stability conditions. Should try to draw a bigger arrow to go in. This is an infinitesimal result, but I can't draw a small arrow that's still readable. Um, so th the point is that we understand or we try to understand case stability in the CSEK story, which we see as a kind of formal limit where a lot of the interesting behavior collapses. And we're interested in comparing the, the kind of behavior at infinity to the behavior for epsilon very small. So this is a sort of wall crossing story in algebraic geometry. So what happens? First of all, this one 
the algebra geometric theorem is basically just a consequence of the definitions and really doesn't warrant the, the name theorem. So this says that if X is K unstable, so there's a, a test configuration with negative donaldson Kotaki invariant, then actually it's said unstable, um, said epsilon unstable for all small epsilon. So this is saying, if you're unstable in this uh, limit at infinity, then you remain unstable as you come into the space of non-trivial stability conditions. So uh, at least it's then very easy to get examples of uh, Z unstable varieties just by um, using the, the case stability theory. The differential geometric analog of the statement is actually much harder. So if XL, first of all, has no automorphisms, and that's an important condition, and C1 of L is CSCK. So in an analytic sense, this is saying that we're, we're stable in this formal limit as epsilon is equal to zero. Then C1 of L admits Z epsilon critical Kähler metrics for all epsilon small. So in an analytic sense, going back to the space of stability conditions, if we're analytically stable, so we have a CFCK metric at this limit, this formal limit in the boundary, then we can perturb into the space of non-trivial stability conditions, and we actually still get a solution to this BDE. Th this is sort of something you expect to formally be a consequence of the um, inverse function theorem, but it, it's actually uh, extremely hard because we're perturbing from a, a fourth order PDE to a sixth order PDE. And when you're changing the order of PDE, these sorts of openness properties are, are difficult, um, to say the least. Okay, so what's the remaining case? The interesting case then is the strictly semi-stable case. So so in the semi-stable case, so the k-semi-stable case, the, there's k-stable, k-semi-stable, k-unstable. Um, okay, and so what we'll do is we'll say that XL is analytically k-semi-stable. If there exists a test configuration XL with central fiber X0, L0 um, smooth and CSCK. So this is a sort of analytic counterpart to the notion of case semi-stability. It's motivated by uh, ideas, the definition, it's motivated by results and um, moment map theory and geometric invariant theory. Okay, so this is the, the most interesting of the results. So it's saying, going back to the space of stability conditions, now we're in the strictly semi-stable case at infinity. And now we can imagine two different things happening when we perturb into the space of uh, non-trivial stability conditions. Either we go into some kind of stable regime or we go into some kind of unstable regime. But the, the key interesting thing is that we can mean that in both an analytic sense and an algebraic sense. So what the result says is that actually those two senses agree. So it says that as we pass from the, the limiting case, epsilon equals zero to epsilon positive, then the, the two conditions actually agree. So XL is analytically, so our assumption is that XL is analytically K semi-stable. Then the statement is that XL is set epsilon, sorry, asymptotically said stable. So stable for all epsilon very small, if and only if C1 of L admits Z epsilon critical Kähler metrics for all epsilon small. 
So it's telling you what the behavior is for very small epsilon based on the behavior at epsilon equals zero. And it's really telling you that the, the stable and unstable parts of the space of stability conditions actually agree in, the, in this model case. I should say that, that for the experts who might call me up on this, um, this, this direction, the existence implies stability, this only holds in a kind of local sense. Anyway, so the, the, the point is that this proves the main conjecture, namely existence implies stability in a model case that I, I think is enough to tell you that the geometry of the problem is correct, but it also has this nice interpretation in terms of what happens in the space of stability conditions. So that's some uh, geometry to this uh, story linking the solvability of geometric PDEs to algebra geometric stability, which was the original motivation. So that's the end and uh, thanks a lot for listening. <clears throat> thank you, thank you very much. Um, are there some uh, comments or, or, or remarks or questions? I have plenty of questions, so maybe I shouldn't start, but uh, Stephen. Oh, you're on mute. I'm, I'm not an expert. Uh -huh. um, so your last comment uh, intrigues me. Uh, what do you mean by locally? Uh, okay, yeah. So we've got this, this thing that we basically understand, this x0, l0. That's, that's a complex manifold, and you can ask for its deformations, so the small deformations of this complex manifold. And in fact, that's, they're only a, there's a finite dimensional space of such deformations. Um, so you see that x is a deformation of x0, but there are also potentially some other uh, um, deformations, but only a, a finite dimensional amount of them. And so for anything induced by that finite dimensional space of deformations, you get stability. So it's related to this um, Kuranishi theory in complex geometry. So in, par in particular, you, you, you get examples of treatly case semi-stable um, manifold in such a way that there is no, um, sorry, yes, there is, there, but there are some uh, Z epsilon uh, uh, critical metrics as close as you want. So do you get this? Form yeah. So formally you do. Um, so what you need to do is to just compute these invariants in an example of a deformation. Uh, sorry, yeah, of a deformation of a K polystable Kähler Einstein or CSCK thing. So you can take these strictly semi stable Fano threefolds and just go and compute these invariants except actually sometimes computing these invariants is a bit tricky and the paper became extremely long. So I, I didn't, uh, I, I haven't actually done any of these computations, but it should be completely doable to, to actually compute these. The, the stability implies existence. The, the benefit of this local sense is that actually you only need to consider finitely many test configurations to conclude that you get solutions to the PDE. So it's completely practical. So I, there, there should be examples, but I, I don't actually have any examples. Okay. So I have a, also a question, if I may. Mm -hmm. uh, so do you think that there is a relevant notion of uniform stability that could uh, somehow get a, a if and only if condition? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I, I, I think, a lot of intuition comes from the toric case. And so it would be nice to understand what the natural notion of uniform stability is in the toric case. My, my suspicion is that probably actually the same norm, like the L1 norm or the minimum norm or the mm -hmm. non-Archimedean J functional, depending on yeah. what you like to call it. So I, I think that's probably still the correct energy functional to, um, uh, yeah, the correct norm to define uniform stability with respect to. But I, I don't, I don't have good intuition yet to say exactly what I think should happen. Okay. I have another question because mm -hmm. you are expert about uh, Keller stability. Mm -hmm. So uh, why you didn't try to write everything for just 
scalar classes and not um, necessarily polarized manifold. Where, where does it where where does it end up work? There, there is there is one technical statement that I needed that I think probably also holds in the Kaler case, but I I couldn't find anywhere that it was discussed, which was about the uniqueness. So if you have on the same manifold, two different biholomorphic complex structures, then the results telling you about when biholomorphisms preserve line bundles. So you can find these in uh, Newstead's book on invariant theory. Um, and I, I needed that at some technical point in the paper. I, I think probably I didn't need that if I'd worked harder but I, I needed it, so um, I assumed it. But the definitions all work in the Kaler case. Stability makes sense, existence makes sense. And yeah, so because I was interested in deformations, there was some results about deformations of complex structures that I could only find a reference for that used algebraic techniques. Um, but I, I expect it can be removed. And is there a kind of similar idea that could work for vector bundles and a Hamish and Einstein uh, equation? Yeah, so this was our original. So I wrote a paper with uh, Larry Seknan and uh, this guy, John McCarthy, where that was exactly our motivation. We wanted to, so there's this very important popular story of bridge instability of vector bundles, but really precisely uh, complexes of coherent sheaves and elements of this derived category of coherent sheaves where you can ask then for a differential geometric counterpart to that story. And so we wrote a paper where we at least answered that question pretty convincingly in the case of vector bundles. So it's, it's completely parallel. You, you choose a central charge, which involves some churn classes of the vector bundle and some topological information on the manifold. And you write down a PDE in such a way that in some special case, you recover the Hermite Einstein condition. So we, we then prove some stronger results, but broadly similar results to the story I've said today. So results along the lines of, in some kind of large volume limit, assuming some smoothness, existence is equivalent to stability. We, we get stronger results, like existence implies stability in general, for example, um, in the large volume limit. And the techniques are very different, actually. So the techniques in this paper were much harder and more, more general, but the, but the motivation was false, exactly. Is it a fourth order PD that you get at that time? I mean, or a second I, order? It's a second order PD. So there's no, you don't get this uh, difficulty of jumping in order of derivatives. And so you can, if you followed the strategy of my paper, which came afterwards, you can just reduce to a finite dimensional problem using the actual implicit function theorem, which is, uh, so we, we instead used a more direct vector bundle specific method to the whole problem that I think it's quite nice. It involves some nice geometry of vector bundles, but it's um, it's more technical once like the, the, the paper, this manifold paper is a bit more geometric. Um, so the, the difficulty in the vector bundle case is that you get non-linearity in the curvature. So you get terms like F wedge F, um, which is bad from the point of view of geometric analysis. So it's not jumping in numbers of derivatives, but like the, the new difficulty is nonlinearity in the curvature, which also is interesting and novel, but also seems hard. The, the, the weight, should, I, should we think about this weight? Uh, uh, I don't know how you call it for the um, Z epsilon critical kind of metric. Mm -hmm. Should we think that it can be written as uh, uh, some function, some simple function of the donaldson futaki weight and, and some order of epsilon? Is it that simple or is it more, much more? No, no, it's more than that. So I think probably my, my guess, and so I, I think Francis Kerwin has been thinking about some similar things and um, probably it involves some kind of, instead of just weight polynomials, you um, choose weight functions on the, the space of sections somehow, 
like you you do weighted sums of the the weights rather than just summing the weights and there should be fairly arbitrary so like for example for the leading order term um usually this is something like a volume like um curly l to the n plus one it's the volume of the Aconcov body but you could choose a non-standard measure on that space and get something else and I, I think that sort of thing is probably more what the kind of weight space weight polynomial analog is so in particular i have no idea how to actually recover these numerical invariants using weight polynomials that's that's completely beyond what i'm able to do um, but it, i think it's important because then you would get a definition that makes sense without any kind of smoothness assumption and that's usually pretty critical to get uh, actual links with analysis. So it's important, but I don't know how to do it. Fascinating, thank you. Thank you so much. Are there other questions, remarks? I, I have a question, uh, another question for non-expert. Mm -hmm. uh, you also, uh, at the beginning, mentioned uh, connections with wall crossing. Yes. I this picture gives you an idea of a, I mean, does it, does it give you a picture of wall crossing and does it give, does it shed light on it? It gives you a picture. I'm not sure if it shed lights or sheds light. <laughs> I mean, that's not, yeah. Um, so the story should be that um, step one, uh, choose a stability condition. So a central charge. And so what this should produce, which is very difficult and very conjectural, is a moduli space of stable varieties. So th this is very conjectural, I mean, and difficult. Uh, so of stable varieties with respect to this stability condition. Chamber. So you, you fix a stability condition, you get a moduli space of stable varieties. Step two, vary the stability condition in the space of stability conditions and ask how the moduli space changes. And conjecturally, what you get is a, a wall and chamber decomposition of the space of stability conditions in which the moduli space is actually the same for stability conditions in that chamber. And as you cross from chamber to chamber, so you pass a wall, the moduli spaces should undergo some kind of birational transformations. Um, so step two, vary the stability condition and obtain birational transformations as you cross a, a wall of the moduli spaces. Now, so, okay, so what's, what's the actual relevance of what I, I actually proved? Really what it says is that, so these walls, you can define them both in terms of differential geometry, where you say that stable actually means having a solution to the PDE, or you could define it in terms of algebraic geometry, where stable means said stable. And really the main result says that the, the differential geometric wall agrees with the algebra geometric wall in this special case. So it tells you that you should be able to approach the wall crossing problem either using differential geometry or using algebraic geometry. So the, the, the program is basically that it gives some kind of differential geometric approach to wall crossing. Um, but that's all very conjectural and very difficult and, and so on, but at least that should be the, the picture. I'm not convinced that really sheds light on anything, but I, I think it's the right picture to have in mind nevertheless. It might shade uh, maybe, maybe very good light. Maybe, it. yeah, yeah. No, hopefully, let's hope. Yeah, I mean, it, it did for Bridgeland stability, actually. That, those are basically all of the applications of Bridgeland stability, that exact idea, and that's been really successful. So, yeah. 